my presentation today is on how snakes fly. I'm going to give you guys a little bit of background on myself and what I do before I get into the the uh, the heart of the my presentation today. Okay, so my lab studies comparative biomechanics, and for those of you who aren't aware of what this means, or if you haven't heard of this, uh, biomechanics, in my view, is the study of how living things function from a mechanical perspective. And the word comparative in front of this means that we, we study more than humans. So you might have, if you're familiar with biomechanics, you might have seen studies in human biomechanics, but the, the living world is a beautiful, amazing thing with all kinds of interesting things going on. And we think that, um, so for myself, I wanna understand how those things work, you know, from a, from a basic um, fundamental perspective, but also um, for my engineering colleagues, I'm interested in trying to take what we understand from nature and potentially apply it to um, new engineering design. Um, and as you'll see in a second, I'm not quite an engineer, but I, I, live, I live in that world as well. So let, let me tell you about my, my background. Okay, uh, or actually first, let me go through the, some of the questions that we, we uh, address in my lab. Um, how do frogs hop on water? How do, how do ducks land on water? How do insects use compressible tubes to breathe? So they have a, a very interesting, funky, way of breathing where they have tubes that go all throughout the, throughout their body and some of them squeeze them. So we're trying to understand how that works. How do insects circulate their blood? Which is a really interesting question because insects are big squishy bags of fluid and they have an open circulatory system, meaning that the, the, the blood is really not in vessels. So how do you circulate blood when you have that type of a system? Um, and then, you know, the, what we're going to be talking about today is about snakes. So we have lots of snake focused questions. How do they fly? How do they land? How do they cross gaps? Um, some weird things that, that come of this just from studying them. We notice that they stick out their tongues in weird times. So we're asking why they stick out their tongues and you know, if that serves some kind of a function. Um, so th this is not everything that we're working on, but it, it gives you a small taste of the, the types of things that we do in our lab. And our lab is, um, we're, we're very experimental. So we do lots of experiments in the lab. So you see some in-lab stuff here. Um, we also set up experiments outside or, or, or weird ones like this one. This involves a kiddie pool. Um, and we work in the field as well. Um, and, and some of our flying snake work, you, you'll see that um, we, we often build things in, in big fields and, and uh, take advantage of, of open space. So we do some we do some weird things. Okay, so now my background. So um, when I went to college, I studied um, two sciences. I studied physics and biology. So that's where my my uh, I was expressing that I'm not an engineer, which is which is true, um, but I did study physics. Um, and you know, going back in time, I kind of do wish that I had studied engineering because some of the some of the the relevant background for the work that I do today. Um, is in those engineering courses, for example, fluid mechanics, which I then, I, I then took later. Um, after college, I, I was actually a high school teacher. So I was in uh, the Teach for America program and I was in Southern Louisiana. So you can see Keelan here uh, catching some crawfish. So he was a high school student that was, he would get up before school and uh, check his traps. Um, I was also the, the cross country coach and assistant track coach. Um, and this is not me at prom. This is me being the, um, I was the prom advisor, which I was terrible at. Um, luckily, this is um, another teacher at the school who later became my wife. And so she helped rescue this and actually made this prom work. So anyway, that, that was for two years. Um, and I realized that I wanted to be a scientist. So I went to graduate school. So I got my PhD at the University of Chicago. Um, for those of you who's, who've seen the movie When Harry Met Sally, this is from the, the that gate at the beginning of the, I think it's at the beginning of the movie. Um, and my office is right here um, above this gate. Um, so um, in graduate school, I started studying flying snakes and I really haven't stopped studying them um, since then. I, I started in uh, 1996. Um, 
So after I got my PhD, I actually worked at a national lab. So this is Argonne National Lab. And this is the advanced photon source, this big ring you, you see here. Um, that produces um, the world's most powerful x-rays, which we used, of course, to look into insects, right? What do you do with the world's most powerful x-rays? You peer inside of insects. Um, and we've made many discoveries with that. And that's kind of how half my lab um, is involved in, in insect work and, and other small um, critters, like asking them what, what's going on inside their bodies. And um, after my postdoc, I then moved to Virginia Tech in 2008. Um, and this is my lab as of, as of last summer. Um, so uh, it's actually, this group here is a mix of graduate students and postdocs, um, college students, um, even a high school student here. Um, you see the, for those of you, many of you from Roanoke there, the little VBR there, he, he's from Blacksburg, who plays in Roanoke. Um, yeah, so that's my, that's my, my group. Um, all right, let's get into it then. Okay, so a main focus of our lab is centers around this pretty simple question, which is how do you turn a normal snake, like the one you see here on the left, into a flying snake, like the one you see here on the right? So, so of snakes, there are um, between three and 4,000 species, roughly. And of the flying snakes, there are not that many. There's only five species. And they're all closely related. They're in the same genus. Okay? So we think that gliding evolved once in snakes. And it's a pretty, it's a pretty rare thing. But when they did it, it's, it's also a spectacular thing. So what are, the, what are the steps that you need to transform yourself into a snake that can't fly into one that, that can fly? And to understand that, you really have to understand what it means to be able to fly if you're a snake, okay? What things are necessary, what things are not necessary. Okay? And you, you would think that for a flyer, you need wings, but as you can see here in this picture, there, there are no wings, right? So, so how in the world does that, um, does that happen? Okay, so let me, let me give, give you a bit of an overview of flight. So flight has actually evolved four times and by, by flight, I mean active flapping flight, things that can go up into the air, okay? And those include insects, bats, birds, and pterosaurs. And for those of you who are, are like these, these things are extinct, of course. Uh, it would be cool if we still have them around, but we don't. Um, these are actually not dinosaurs. Um, they're pterosaurs, uh, but they did live in that, in that time period. However, gliding and what gliding means is that you have some way of getting up into the air and once you're up in the air you move downward in the air and as you move downward you are able to generate some kind of aerodynamic force that propels you in a horizontal direction okay so the ones you're probably most familiar with are like flying squirrels this is not a flying squirrel this is a klugo by the way it's in Southeast Asia. There's lots of different mammals that glide. Um, but gliding has evolved numerous times, so more than 30 times. And things like frogs and lizards, this is a Draco lizard, um, this is a gecko, um, and things like fish, so they jump into the air to get there. Um, the weirdest one, I think, maybe not be, maybe not be the snake, but the, may not be the snake, uh, but squid so this is you know this is a truly bizarre thing where these things jump out of the water and they've got um you know aerodynamic surfaces up front and in the back um it's a truly weird flyer um, and then i include insects here because there are insects that don't have wings and yet still glide okay so an insect that has wings and glides well that's that's no big deal but there are ants that will fall off of trees and they'll move horizontally and land on, on, on a tree. And that's, that's pretty amazing. So our question though centers around the snake. So how do you turn this cylindrical like thing into a glider? And you should notice one thing is that um, all these other critters have some kind of surface 
that they put out to the side. Even, even the ants here are using their, their legs and they're symmetrical from left to right. And these snakes are not, and they don't have any wings, they don't have any appendages. So to me, they're a truly um, bizarre question to, to, to work on of, of how they do that. Okay, so um, this is an overview of the flying snakes. So I said there are five species. Um, here's one here, here's another, here's another. And here's the main one that I, I work on is the paradise tree snake. Um, there's one that um, I think there's, there might be a photo or two out there on the web, but I don't, I don't have them. Uh, but it's one that um, I really would like to work on. So I have actually worked on this one and this one and this one. I've not worked on this one from Sri Lanka or the, the Malukan flying snake as well. But what's important here are two things. So one is that they live in trees. And so and these trees can get quite tall and they can then get up to a high spot and they can then start their glide from, from a height. Um, and number two is that um, generally they live in, in South and Southeast Asia. So from Southern China down through Malaysia and Indonesia and the Philippines, and then they kind of stop over here as well. But they're also found in India on the West Coast and in, in Sri Lanka as well, okay? Um, now, uh, how big are they? So this looks like a big snake, but in reality, um, it, it kind of fits in my hand there. You can see um, I'm not a giant person, so that's not a very big snake. They're about a couple feet long at max. Um, the best gliders are about as wide as my my finger. Um, and the, you know, this is an adult, but even the, even the small ones can glide. So here's one you can see my hands. So that, that's, that's the same hand there. Um, this is a, a hatchling flying snake. It's really tiny. It's about two grams. And even those little tiny ones can, can glide. So they're really cool. Um, let me give you some history. So prior to my work, there was an understanding that there were flying snakes, okay? So I did not discover flying snakes whatsoever, okay? Um, so, but there wasn't much experimental work done. This was probably the most detailed study, and it was really a short study. And in the study, a, a uh, herpetologist from the Smithsonian up in D.C. was in Thailand and caught some flying snakes, and he went to a, a tower that was 44 meters up. That's 11 stories. That's really high. And you can see my, my accurate drawing here was he was holding the snakes out like this, and then he dropped them. <laughs> so, uh, so what happened was the flying snakes would uh, get some horizontal distance. They're gliding in the air. And the non-flying snakes did not glide. Um, and no real report about what happened. And this, I think this study would probably not be approved today. Um, so flying snakes can glide, other snakes cannot. So that was, that was established. Okay, so um, aside from that, um, the rest of the, the, the work, um, or the rest of the experimental work has been done pretty much in my lab. Um, and so I'm gonna take you through two components of that. I'm gonna take you through takeoff briefly, and then I'll take, uh, take you through the actual gliding. We'll spend more time on that. So I would actually say that, it, that it's probably easy to be a glider if you're a snake and you're a cylinder, except for a few minor problems. Minor problem number one would be takeoff, then gliding, and then landing. Aside from that, it's super easy, right? Um, can't hear the audience. That was a bad joke. Okay, so um, if, if you have legs, you can jump off of things. And this is a Draco taking off. And you can see as this uh, Draco jumps from the stick, you see it here jumping again, but then deploys its ribs and it, its, uh, its flight surface, right? So these are really cool gliders, okay? But my point is here is that you have legs and then you can jump and you can get up into the air. So how do you do it if you're a flying snake? Um, and well, the answer is, that they actually jump as well. So um, a feature of the snake is that they have no legs, right? Um, still have no legs, um, but yet they're able to jump. So here is one, and we're kind of looking up at the snake, and it is literally leaping over your head. Okay, so this is the takeoff, and now it's uh, gliding 
behind us. Okay, so what's going on? So they hang from a branch in a J shape. They accelerate their head upward. They hold on to the branch back here, and then they let it go. And then as they're leaping out, they flatten their bodies, right? And this is, this is really cool, and it's a really key part of how they glide. So what they do is from here at the head to all the way to where the tail starts, they will flatten their bodies out. Okay, this is kind of like a cobra that will flatten its body behind its head as well. Okay, except they do it, um, these flying snakes do it all the way down the body. And it happens fast in um, less than a third of a second. Okay, so they get into the air, they transform into a, a flying like thing. Okay, now let's talk about the actual gliding and um, so you know what I'm talking about, I'm going to show you a couple of movies of, of lighting. Okay, so this is an overhead view, and this is a snake that is gliding through the air. Um, I think I was a little, little more than 35 feet up here. And as, you, as I slow it down, you can see that the head is moving back and forth, and it makes these big waves in the body, and then it lands. And uh, actually, I cut the video off, but it... it the snake keeps on going, right? So whoop, there it goes, right? And then that is my helper who caught the, the snake. And this was my very first experiment in 1997. I didn't know how to really handle snakes or catch snakes or do anything with snakes. And so, and I also didn't have a lot of money. So I went to the grocery store and bought some um, uh, dishwashing gloves to help protect her in case the snake bit her. The snakes, by the way, this is a common question. Do they bite? They do bite. They are a tiny bit venomous, but the venom is not harmful um, to us, and it, it really has no no effect. But I still wanted to protect her. You know, it's nice to it's nice to protect your your helpers, right? To keep them keep them healthy. Okay. So next video. Um, this is one that's shot from the ground by a National Geographic uh, cameraman, and this one's really neat because the snake, for one glided almost right over his head and he was tracking and, and uh, went along with it. It came a couple feet from his, his camera, but it's also neat because you can see that as the snake is undulating back and forth, the tail is kind of whipping around um, doing this kind of bizarre thing. So that's a fun video. Um, this is one that's in slow motion. It's from the side and you can see how flat the snake is. And that was the heart there, by the way. Uh, in fact, let me, let me go back. I'm going to pause it right there. See that little lump? Whoop. We'll see. That lump right there, right. So the that's the heart, and that's because it's this robust tissue, and when the snake flattens out, it, the, the body just goes around it. Okay, so what's neat here is that the head is down and the tail is up. It looks like the take snail, snail. The snake should flip over, but it doesn't, right, because it's a flying snake, and this is what they do. They're, they're experts in the air, and they're always under control. You can see that the head is, is locked in, uh, pointing forward, and the back of the body is kind of going up and down. And when it lands, at least on the ground, and it has enough space, they seem to drop the tail down, as you're seeing right there. And the tail will hit first, and then the head. Boom. So the question is here, why doesn't the snake hurt itself? Well, we think there's a simple answer to that. And, and it, the simple answer is that it's, it's small. Okay. So if the, the mass of the snake is not very much. It's, it's, it's very small. Um, if the snake were say a hundred times more massive, it would probably not survive that. Okay. Uh, another cool thing about the snakes, um, they can turn. Now only one species, the paradise tree snake, is able to turn like this, but it is really amazingly impressive. You can see the snake going toward that little fake tree or little planter tree and then taking a left, fooling my assistant here who was running this way and then she had to change her direction as well because the snake turned in midair. Um, they can also do these sharper turns like this one. Um, so this again is back from 1997. The snake jumps out and then it hangs a quick left here and is now going, you know, I wanted to go to the field and it, it did not. 
Um, also, my assistants here, it kind of scared them half to death, but, um, <laughs> but there you go. Okay, um, so one question, uh, or there's a couple questions here. Um, can they steer to select their landing place? I think I actually can. So I have seen in some of my experiments that um, where I block their vision on one side and they jump out straight, but then once they get past the block, they can see some trees off to the side and then they turn to go in that direction. So to me, it's a, deli it's a deliberate decision by the snake saying, I wanna go over there um, and potentially choosing uh, a landing spot. A um, couple other questions. Um, can they fly after a meal? I don't know uh, because usually my experiments, we purposely wait till they've digested their meal so that it doesn't influence their, their gliding. Um, but I think that they probably can. Um, may probably not as well because they've got, they've got lumps in their body and they're a little bit heavier, right? Uh, the snakes glide more than they slither. Well, they're slithering in the air. Okay, so these are, they're, they're making this motion. And, you know, th the question is, does this motion actually do some, something for their gliding? And I'm going to show you that coming up uh, pretty soon. Um, then one more question is, what's the benefit of this ability? Um, how, would it, how might it evolve? Um, well, if we look at the jumping there, you see how it jumps into the air? I have uh, one of my PhD students is working on a project where she was trying to get them to, to jump across gaps. So instead of jumping to start the glide, they were jumping to cross a small gap. And you can think to yourself, well, why might that be relevant? If you live up high in the trees and you're a snake and you're crawling along the branch and you're looking for food or a mate or trying to escape or do whatever, and you, get, you reach a gap, um, if you can jump across that gap, then you're off to another tree or you're off to another spot and you're good, right? So we might think, or we think that, that the snakes might have evolved that ability first and the ones that didn't quite make it and fall into the air, if you can survive that, then you will live to, to, to mate another day. If you don't survive that, then, then you won't. Your genes are out of the gene pool, right? So that's, that's, um, that's some of what we think might be, might be going along. Um, and then one more. I showed you guys a little tiny snake there that was a hatchling. Um, those ones glide. So we think that they can glide pretty much from the, from the time that they're born. We haven't tested that because we haven't had hatchlings that come out, you know, and test them from day one. Um, but if I had to put money down on it, I would, I would say that that's, what, that's what's gonna happen. Okay. Um, and then one more question, then I'm gonna move on to some slides. Um, how long can they glide? Well, the how far they go depends on how high they start. Okay, so the higher the snake starts, the farther that it can go out in the horizontal distance. Um, but it's not a one-to-one -one thing, right? So if it goes twice as high, it doesn't necessarily go twice as far. In fact, it'll probably go farther. And that's because of the shape of the trajectory that it takes. And I'm gonna show you that in a second. Um, Oh, that was just one more video showing that this one actually flipped over um, and still was able to control itself. You can see it flip over there and then start to undulate and start to glide. So that's pretty neat. Okay, um, so let's talk about how the snake um, generates the aerodynamic forces and how it controls its glide. So. I was, I was talking about the gliders before being symmetrical. So you can imagine a line down the center of the body, um, like in this bird here, and you have left and you have right, and they're symmetrical, right? But that's not so with our flying snake. So one of the things that we thought early on was that, well, a still flying snake in the air is going gonna, is gonna to be a bad scene. It's potentially going to flip over in the air, okay? 
So um, we've been interested in this question for, for quite a long, long time. So let, let me tell you a little bit about how it, it makes those aerodynamic forces, and then we'll get to this question about control. So um, as, I, as I told you before, the snake morphs its body and it makes itself flat all the way down the body, right? And at its, um, at its flattest point, its body becomes double in width of what it, what it is normally. So normally its width goes from here to there, okay? So it really splays, um, splays itself out. And it creates two little lips on the edge there. So you can kind of see the shadow of one here, and there's one here as well. And then from above, it has this sort of triangular type shape, which you can see here as well. And what's doing that are the animal's ribs. So it has um, vertebrae and ribs all the way down its body to where the, the tail starts. And then the tail is just all vertebrae. There's no ribs there. Okay. So what we think is going on is that the snake moves its ribs and it flattens out. And you can see here, here's an x-ray of one that, that happened to be able to flat out, flatten out in my hands and I was able to get a, an x-ray of it. And so what you see in total is you see a rounded snake transforming into this flattened snake. And if we just were to take a cross section and cut the snake um, and look down the end of it, we think that it would look something like this. So there's the triangular shape, there's a sort of flat shape underneath, and then there's the two little lips on each side. So this, in essence, is the wing shape of the flying snake. And for those of you who have ever seen an airplane, I think that's all of you, you'll note that that is a very weird shape for a wing, right? Um, and so one of our, one of our first questions after understanding this was what, what are the aerodynamic ramifications of this, this, this shape? In other words, um, how good is this, this shape at being a wing? And so we did that work here at Virginia Tech in a water tunnel and we could do it because water is a fluid like air and we, we um, match some of the same properties, which I won't get into, um, but it, it let us know what, how good the shape was. So here is the 2D model. We printed it out and it goes across this water tunnel and we're able to measure the forces with um, some instruments up top. And we got this curve. Now, I know a lot of you don't, don't want to see lots of data plots, but this is a really cool one. And I promise you there won't be too many more of this. Okay, so this is lift. Um, so how much upward force on that shape there is versus angle of attack. And angle of attack is how tilted the, um, the foil is. So here's zero with air coming this way. And this would be 90 degrees, right? Like a flat plate. That's really bad for generating force. You can see as we change the angle and tilt it up more and more, this shape produces some nice lift, okay? This is actually really good. Um, and we're kind of surprised about how, how good this was. Um, if you want some perspective, um, this is uh, an airplane wing, um, one example of an airplane wing. And you see that it's better at producing lift at lower angles, um, but then it drops off at around 20 here, meaning that if you tilt it above 20 degrees, it stops producing lift. If you're in a plane that stops producing lift like that, then you start to fall, and that's a, that's a very bad thing. So you can see that the, the snake keeps producing lift even at, at high angles. Um, and one of the reasons why it can do this is because it is small and slow. So if we were to take the snake wing and scale it up to airplane size, it would not behave like this whatsoever. Okay, so we don't really get engineering inspiration for larger airplanes or helicopters, anything like that. Um, however, at, at a small size, it's good. And let me show you how, how good it is in comparison. So this is a complicated plot, but all you need to know is that as the number gets bigger, as you're going up, that means more lift. Um, and this on this axis here is just the size and shape of uh, the, 
the size and shape and speed of the of the of the airfoil. Okay, so if you look at this one, this one looks like oh that's like a, that's a good wing, right? But up here is a model of a snake that has no lips. This is one that has lips, and this is the this is an anatomically accurate um, snake. This thing just kind of crushes this uh, this airplane like wing at the size and speed of the of the snake. Okay, and that was really surprising to us. So at snake speed and size, it's actually pretty good. So that's neat. Okay, um, let's talk about the wiggling motion in the air. Okay, so the, the side to side motion, this undulation, that's a very prominent feature of its gliding. Um, and we think that it's unique. So in the air, the snake is doing this undulation and it's also moving up and down and it has to deal with being in the air. Um, everything else that we know for animals that undulate, um, they're either doing it on a surface or they're doing it in, in water and their undulation is usually more side to side. It doesn't involve this up and down as well. So we think that this is a really fundamental and interesting question. So the work I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you was just published um, at the end of June in a paper in the journal called Nature Physics. Okay, so there's the first page of the paper. And if any of you saw some media attention in the past month or so about flying snakes, it came because we, we published this paper. And, and the, the title gives away the punchline of the story, which is Undulation Enables Gliding and Flying Snakes. And I'll, I'll explain that as we go along. But, but first I'm gonna show you some fun things, which are um, some of the crazy media coverage that we got. And we think that it's because everyone is pent up and in their homes, um, and this is just a crazy year. So um, we had to add flying snakes to it. And so we get stories like this one, like, did you know flying snakes existed? <laughs> and my answer was yes, yes, we did. We have known that for a long time. It's not new in 2020. So um, don't go around telling people that, um, you know, we discovered flying snakes in 2020. That, that is not, that's not true. Um, and this was also fun because I never thought that I would, some of my work would be next to Hamilton. That was kind of, that was kind of neat. Okay. So this is another one. Um, those of you who are football fans, you know who Bud Foster is. He's the coach here at Virginia Tech. This is his Twitter feed. And if you go through his Twitter feed, you'll see football story, football story, fo sports, football, sports. And then, um, so here's one that look, you know, um, this is on July 2nd, by the way, football story that he retweeted. And then, boom, flying snake story, and then back to football. So I felt very honored that um, he was interested in our, our flying snakes. Um, here's another one <laughs> that uh, made me laugh. Um, I don't know who this person is. Um, my guess he was born in 1993, maybe. Um, I started off really interested at this, but now I think if we don't kill this guy and his team history will reflect poorly on us. Um, so this is my first ever death threat that was public. I think he was joking, I'm gonna assume that. Um, but yes, if, if they had killed us off early on, we would not have flying snake work. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, let me tell so let me go into this. Um, and I see there's some those questions, some questions are coming up and I will I will get to them if they come into this material. Um, if not, I'll, I'll get back to those. Um, right after I show you guys this, okay? Okay, so um, my previous work, I, I put markers on the snakes that we could track them, and it did okay, um, three or five, but it really was not enough. So, so it, you know, if you look at this, this gives us like a triangle, this is getting a little better, um, but if you look at movies from these points, this is what it looks like. And I just, I, I, you guys now know what a flying snake looks like gliding through the air, and, and it, you know, that's a, that's a rough approximation, right? So we did this, oh, and, and we, we do these studies outdoors usually, launching them from towers like this, and we have cameras recording them. Um, yeah, so that, that's how we work. So um, this was an experiment that we did recently here at Virginia Tech at the Moss Art Center. So that may sound bizarre. It is bizarre uh, because I, you know, 
gliding animals in an art center is not a typical thing, but there's this place at the Moss Art Center called The Cube. And The Cube is a four-story black box theater. It's really amazing. It's this fantastic facility. Um, you can see it's got um, these railings that you can walk around, um, this empty space. Um, but what's really, really good for us is that it was ringed with cameras and we can put them on the rails that you're seeing there. And it's a motion capture system where we can get the 3D points instantaneously um, in, in that system. Okay, so this is really fantastic for us. And so um, we arranged the cameras so that it was in view of, of the snakes gliding through. We recorded them at a, at a high rate and um, we put uh, tape markers on them. So you might have seen motion capture where you have these little balls that are on on uh, people where, where they're, they're trying to get the 3D movements for uh, making cartoons or for making video games. Uh, we couldn't put those in the snakes because potentially would affect their gliding. So we, we used tape um, and it, it worked. Uh, we also had some cameras up above. These are high speed cameras that are above the facility. And then we, we wanted to make sure that the snakes survived. And so we put padding down on the ground. We lined the whole thing with this, with this foam padding. Um, if you ever wonder what $2,000 worth of foam padding looks like, that is it. That's on, on a pallet there. Um, and then we had a lift here, which, which we're hiding behind these sheets. Um, and so we, we would lift it ourselves up to the highest we could get before bonking into this, this uh, walkway up top. And we glided this next from there. And this is what it looked like from above. So you can see the padding. Um, here's a stick that we're launching the snakes from. This is a little fake tree that they could they could um, try to target. And this is a grad student who's exhausted because she's been working very, very hard. Um, and then we calibrate the room um, with a little stick. You probably can't see it, but there's, there's, uh, there's a T at the end of this. So that's how the cameras know what the, what the three coordinates are of, of the space. And this is us putting tape on the snake. Uh, there's the snake about to jump. There it's just jumped into the air. Now it's gliding. And um, occasionally, if you if you grab it wrong, it will bite you as well. So this is a little bite mark. So you can see the lo lower teeth and the upper teeth here as well. Um, this uh, d doesn't really hurt. So And we just wash in soap and water, and we're good. In fact, um, there's Talia, the one who got bit there. And uh, oh. Um, we bake the snakes too, so they're they're native to Southeast Asia, where it, the the temperatures are warm there. So we we did the the trials at um, a nice tropical temperature that they they um, they really enjoy. And after each trial, then we put the snake in a bag and deliver it back up to the top of the lift. All right, so here's video of the snake. Um, it's taken off. And there it's gliding, and then it's on, you know, this thick foam padding, so you see it bounce off, right? Um, here it is in slow motion. You can see the marks on the animal. Um, you can see the undulation. It's, uh, you know, you see that undulation very, very prominently. So with all those marks, we now have this really beautiful ability to track the snake as it's going through the air. Okay, so this, this pattern here are all those points tracked throughout the glide. And so what we could do with that is we can make this model. Okay, so here are all the points and we then use math to fill in the spots there, right? And because we had enough points, we could actually do so in a nice smooth way. Um, now that's math, I'll skip the math. I'll skip the math, we did more math. We did lots of math. Um, and then we need to know how thick the snake is. So we measured that from, from images. And then lastly, we need to know where the mass was in the body. Now, if you're eating lunch or you don't like seeing gross anatomy, I would turn your head away right now because I'm gonna show you something gross, okay? You turn your head away? Good, okay, so we had snakes that died. They died naturally. 
Um, and we put them in our freezer because we might use them later. So these are frozen snakes. We take the frozen snakes out and we cut the body up into one centimeter pieces and then we weigh each piece. And then from that, we get a distribution of the mass along the body. So we can tell that the snake has the most mass in the middle of the body and at the tail there, there's actually not much, much mass in the tail. It's kind of flimsy. Okay, so with that, we could then make this really uh, beautiful model where we know what the mass is, we know what the width is, we know what the shape is, so we put the shape on top of that as well. And so um, we can now do this. This is a movie of those points, and you're looking at a top view, and this is our model, but it's based on the points that we recorded in the cube there, right? So this is really, really fantastic. Now I'm rotating it to the side, and so you can see the same thing from the side. And if you remember back to the movie I showed you, this looks really similar to the movie, right? Um, but this is the first fully accurate 3D model of a snake moving in the air, okay? And what's cool is when we look at it from behind, we can see that the, the parts of the body are sort of angled to each other, and they, they almost look like they're Xing over um, and they're forming a Z or, or, you know, they're crossing at some point. Um, and it's, you know, this is a really neat, interesting glider. Okay. Okay. So with that, um, and so we can get to some questions. I'm actually going to go through this quickly. Um, from this, we could actually do lots of measurements and we could figure out that the snakes actually have two waves of bending. They have the side to side thing that you see from the top. You're like, okay, that's no big deal. I see that with my eyes. They also have a vertical wave like this. Okay. And that is something we discovered because we had um, these really nice data. And what's really weird about this is that the vertical wave, which you can see here in green has twice the frequency as the side to side wave. So, so if the side to side wave is going like this, the, the up and down wave is going twice as fast, which is weird, okay? Um, and one of the reasons it's weird is we, we've only seen this in one other snake and that's a sidewinder. Um, so in the study of a sidewinder, they discovered that they also use two waves, a side to side wave and a vertical wave as well, but their waves are exactly one to one. So frequency, frequency the same. So our flying snakes are, are, are fascinating. Um, yeah, let me just skip that. Okay, so with our model, we can now ask questions that we could not with any other type of experiment. Okay, so this is now um, a model of the snake and we're using the, the features of the snake that we discovered from that experiment, okay? And then we are now adding on their dynamic components and also how the mass moves back and forth, okay? And um, that's just details. If you wanna know the details, you can read that paper. <laughs> um, it's on my website, so you can find it there. Um, okay, so here's the experiment that we could do that we could not do with a real snake. So this is gliding with undulation, okay? And this is our, this is our model, okay? And it's not, it's not perfect, it's pretty good. So you see the forces, the lift and drag that are being generated on the animal. You can see a side view here um, of the glide, okay? And again, it's not perfect. This is not as good as the real flying snake, but it's pretty good. Now, what if you now turned off this, this wiggling, this undulation in the air? So that's what we did here. We turned it off. So this, we now release the, the virtual snake and this is what it does, okay? It still gets some force on it, but because it's asymmetrical, what you can see there is it starts to rotate. And now um, we stop the simulation at this point because the snake is fully on its side, okay? We, we're like, once it's there, this thing has failed. The snake is not gonna recover from this, okay? So what we think is that 
this wiggling back and forth, this undulation is what gives the snake stability. It's what enables it to stay upright and to be able to glide forward. And if you turn it off, the snake would not be able to go very far at all, you know, if any, okay? So this is why we think that the undulation is a really key feature of how snakes are able to glide. Okay, now, um, oh, let me show you one more thing. I'll show you one more thing and then, then I'll end it and take some questions, okay? So um, I showed you that there's a couple species. This is the one that I was working on, the Chrysophila paradisi, the paradise tree snake. This is the golden tree snake. They're a little bigger, they're a little chunkier, and they don't quite glide as well. So if you look at horizontal distance traveled um, from the same height, this is the paradise tree snake, this is the golden tree snake, it only goes half as far, okay? Not quite as good, but it undulates in the same way. Um, we don't quite know why this thing can't go as far, but I wanna show you a movie because there might be some answers to this in this video here, um, which we, we need to back up with actual experiments. But you can see here, as, it, as the snake starts to become into focus, which it will in a second, so, don't adjust your screen. Um, the snake does not seem to be as organized as the other snake. It seems to be kind of struggling in the air and its body seems to be floppier. And it seems to be able to, to not be able to position its, its body in the right place. You can see that it becomes a little more upright as well. So we think that the actual relative spacing of, of the body might contribute to the ability of the, the snakes to glide as well, okay? Okay, so um, with that, I am going, this is just my, my acknowledgement slide to people who have funded me, to people who have helped out. This is not everyone, by the way, this is just some people with this, this last experiment. Um, and with that, I have a list of questions here that I would like to that I would like to get to. Um, do the snakes fly when they're pregnant? Um, someone's knocking at my door. Um, the answer is uh, we haven't done that study, so we don't actually we don't actually know. And certainly, when we were trying to breed them in our lab, we would not glide them because we we would like to you know if it does harm the the, the eggs inside of them, we we wouldn't want that to happen. So. That's an open question. Um, how do the snakes extend their ribs? So we know that they use some muscles to do that. So there's, there's muscles that are attached from the vertebra to the rib. And when you pull those muscles, it can then move the ribs. We don't know exactly how that works, but we do know that it's, it's, um, it's like a pulley system, right? So if you attached a rope to a pole and then you pulled on that rope, you could get the pole to move back and forth. Um, yeah. Um, how many snakes do you keep in your lab for study? Um, and do we breed them? Yeah, so um, we do keep our snakes here at Virginia Tech. Um, I have a special room designed for them. So it's designed with high humidity and high temperature to, to mimic what they see in, in Southeast Asia and keep them happy. Um, and we are trying to breed them, but we have not succeeded yet. Um, we've gotten the eggs, but we've had trouble with getting the eggs to the next step. And, and actually, we're, I've consulted, there's an expert here um, in the biology department um, who is telling us um, that we were, we're missing, we're doing a couple things wrong with the humidity. So if you want to get the humidity right, you get fungus on the eggs. Um, so we're hoping that our next round, we actually get, get some little, little babies. Um, what was the greatest distance measured for a snake's glide in my experiment? The length of the glide height. Okay. Uh, I can give you a couple of, couple of answers. Um, so from 15 meters up, which is about 50 feet, um, we got snakes going about 23, 24 meters out, okay, in one experiment. Um, in another experiment, we were launching from 10 meters up. So that was lower. And um, on average, they were going about 10 meters horizontally. But we did hundreds of glides and we got some exceptional glides. 
the most exceptional one was a 21 meter glide from a 10 meter height. So you're 10 meters up, and you go 21 meters out. Um, and at, so the snake is doing this nonlinear trajectory where it's going steeper and then it shallows out. Okay, so it's like a curve. And at the end of that curve there, it was going about 13 degrees from the horizontal. So really, really super impressive. Um, I do not know how far they would go if we brought them to the tallest tree in Southeast Asia. Um, yeah, those trees can get up to like 60, 65 meters or so. Um, and, you know, really if, if we had that snake doing that glide, um, it would really, really go far. Uh, maybe, but the other thing is we think that they might not be breathing while they're gliding. Um, and that is because they use their ribs to breathe. And when they're in the air, they're all flattened out. So we suspect that they're actually holding their breath, but it's just for a couple of seconds. So it's not, doesn't seem to be a, pro a problem. Um, are their bones the same density material as other snakes? That is a great question. Um, some of my students have, have talked to me about wanting to do that measurement as well. Um, because as, as you know, the, for things like birds, they're, they have bones that have lots of air spaces in them. And overall, that makes their skeleton um, less dense, right? Um, there's nothing obvious. Um, so when you, when you look at the bone, you, do, you don't see that type of um, aeration. Um, but we haven't done the actual measurement, so I can't really, I can't really give you a, a definite answer on that. Um, have we ever, okay, this is an interesting question. Have you ever had a snake aim for one of your assistants as a landing spot? Well, um, hmm. I don't know if they necessarily aimed, but I have had snakes that would go toward a person. Let me tell you the context here. So we're, because you have our cameras aimed at a certain spot in a certain way, you want the snakes to go in a certain direction, right? But you can't control their little snaky brains, right? So they would go this way or they go this way and we're like, hey, we want you to go here toward this tree. And we found one of the snakes, it would, the tree is here and yet it would go there. They go there, they go there. And so I said to one of my assistants, hey, um, go to that spot there. If you're standing there, it will, it will go in another direction. And um, the person stood there, and of course the snake still jumped toward them. It didn't land on them, um, but it landed near them. So that didn't seem to deter the snake. Um, and yeah, so I have had um, a couple of weeks ago, so I've always told people, you know, the, the snakes are relatively rare. They live in the forest. Like you, you should, if you live in Southeast Asia, you shouldn't be worried about snakes falling, you know, they're not going to fly onto you. That's not a worry. So I've said that for, for literally decades. Um, just a couple weeks ago, my wife opened the, our screen door downstairs and a snake fell on her head. <laughs> um, and it was a little ring neck snake, a tiny little one like this, this, they're harmless. Um, and I think it had crawled up there and when she moved the sliding door, it just fell, landed on her head. Uh, it did scare her though. Um, and she blames me for that for some reason, because I've said all along that uh, snakes aren't going to fall on your head and hear that, hear that happen. So that's great. So um, are hatchlings better at worse at gliding? Um, uh, so the gliding ability depends on body size. So the bigger, usually the, the bigger you are as a, as a flying snake, the worse you are as a glider. Um, and the smaller you are, it's better, but it's, it's to a point. So it seems like the best ones are about 15 grams and the hatchlings are smaller than that. So they're not quite as good as the ones that are about 15 grams, but they can be better than some of the bigger flying snakes. So the answer to that is yes, yes and no. Um, it, it very much depends on, on body size. Um, would the shape work for drones or for small flying bots? Well, if you're talking about a large drone, it's not going to work there. Um, for something small, 
you know, this all depends on the, 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 the size and the speed. So I'm not sure what it would be optimal for, but you wouldn't want to make it very fast or very big. Um, so small robots are, 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 uh, are good for that. Uh, does the temperature humidity influence the frequency and quality of gliding? Yes. So snakes will take on the, temp the body temperature of their environment. So if you make the temperature colder, their body gets colder and the way that they can activate their muscles changes. So they can't activate their muscles as quick, quickly or as forcefully at colder temperatures as they can at their, at their preferred warmer temperatures. So that's why we do our trials in, this, in the temperatures that they're, they're normally used to. Um, humidity, I don't know. I've never tested that. I, I don't know if that would really have a difference. It will change the, the humidity will change the density of the air slightly, but I don't know if that will have an actual effect. So that's a, that's a good question that I don't have any, an answer to. Um, so do we, um, do we limit the human contact outside of actual tests as to not impact their natural behavior? Ah, okay. Um, so these snakes live all throughout Southeast Asia. And in terms of numbers of them in the wild, um, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of them. Um, and the ones that we've used, so when I've worked in Southeast Asia, um, and when it's possible, we would catch the snake and then we would release the snake. So we would not, we tried to not impact the population. Um, the ones that are here in my lab, obviously we're not gonna, we're not going to re-release anywhere. They will, they will live to old age um, in, into my, in my lab. But we, we literally have, you know, right now I think we have 12, right? So when you compare that 12 to thousands and thousands and thousands of snakes, um, it's really not, um, it, it really shouldn't do anything to that population whatsoever. If it did, we would be, we would be concerned, um, but I, I'm not concerned about that. Okay, Dr. Sorkin, um, do you want to take one more or do you want to call it? I, th um, oh, uh, were any experiments done with varying side wind to test? Uh, that's a really interesting question. Um, we try to do our experiments without wind, so it d doesn't influence the gliding. Um, but we have been asking, well, what happens like, if a gust comes along and perturbs the snake, right? So if you're an airplane in an airplane and you have a gust and it, it, it rocks you, um, the airplane, the passenger jet will will come back to a stable point. What happens if you're a flying snake? Um, that's a great question. And we, we've, we, we've thought about getting big fans and having that fan either turn on or it's blowing and the snake doesn't know it. And then the snake goes through that, that side air to, to answer, to address that question. Um, but we haven't done that experiment yet. There, there's lots of things that we still want to do. All right. Looks like we're out of time for today. Dr. Socha, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thanks for helping us discover more about our world. Thanks to our sponsors, Bon Secours. Uh, so the recording of today's talk is going to be available on YouTube very soon. Uh, please join us next week on August 12th at noon for the Art and Science of Forged Fashion, presented by Ellen Durkin of Iron Maiden Forge. She's a blacksmith. She's an artist. She has amazing things with, uh, with steel. Uh, so you can register for next week's talk at smv.org. Each talk is free to attend and is open to the first 300 registrants. Thank you again for joining us today. Until next week, stay safe and stay curious. <laughs>